I'm a family physician, but I actually believed that abortion was a reasonable decision. Even after I became a Christian, I still referred women for abortion. I didn't have the full awareness of what was actually going on or the full impact of abortion on women. I would send people for abortions and then I would never ask them about it. When I got involved with the local pregnancy care center and women started telling me their stories, mm. I was surprised at how much re regret they had, their sorrow, mm. the grief. It breaks my heart. It's one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing. One patient, she said that her boyfriend's mother forced her to have an abortion. That's intense. It's intense. That is not pro-choice. That is pro-abortion. That is bullying. She approached me and said, you know, when my birth mother placed me for adoption, she really wasn't provided with any support. Here we are funneling millions of dollars into making abortion available, and yet uh, very little is going towards services, right, uh, for women who just simply want support. Yeah, there was really nothing. In our town, I knew that there was nothing. I really want to make sure that no other woman uh, faces that challenge without the help that she needs. Welcome back to the show. Today's topic, you guys, it's a supercharged one. So much so that over the last decades, we have seen authentic discussion of this topic completely shut down at the highest levels of political authority. And I am, of course, talking about the conversation surrounding the controversial issue of abortion. Yep. I just used the A word on television. And even though some of our political leaders refuse to talk about this topic, we are going to tackle it here today because it has so profoundly affected the lives of hundreds of thousands of Canadian women and families from sea to sea. There isn't one region of our land that has not been affected by abortion. And most of us watching this show have in some way been personally affected, whether through our own experiences or that of family and friends. Before we dive in though, I want to set the record straight on one thing, okay? Abortion's legal in Canada, yes, but not by legislation, by omission. There is currently no federal law on abortion in Canada. And we'll talk about this more in future shows, but to bottom line it for today's purposes, in the absence of a law, anything goes, which is why it is legal to abort a baby right up to full term birth in Canada. Canada. I find that most Canadians do not know this or that Canada is actually the only Western nation that has no law on abortion and that should raise an eyebrow or two. Even some of the most committed pro-choice activists do not agree that a woman should be able to abort her child when it's fully formed in the womb and can actually survive outside the womb especially when there are wait times for adoption of newborns in Canada that can last several years. There are so many conversations within this conversations, you guys. You know, there's a conversation about the legislation, the science, the ethics, the impact on women, marriages, families, and of course, this crazy movement to shut down meaningful conversation by some of our elected officials. Most of these, however, are topics for another day. Today, we are going to focus on a Canadian physician's viewpoint and the importance of supporting women in their pregnancy experience. Studies have shown overwhelmingly that most women would choose to keep their babies if they simply had more support from others. And that is a huge statement both of the heart cry of many women and of the need for us as a nation to help them in meaningful ways. So today with me, I have Dr. Laura Lewis, who is not only a doctor, but currently devotes her life to ensuring that vulnerable pregnant women have the help that they need. You know, Dr. Laura has a story to tell though. Um, she didn't always have this focus. Her evolving understanding of the issue of abortion has led her on a personal and profound journey. And today we're gonna to hear a little bit about it. I think you're really going to love and appreciate what she has to share. Let's get to it. Laura. <laughs> oh, so great to have you here. Dr. Laura, 
Uh, not only are you Dr. Laura, but you actually are one of my personal heroes. Aww. You are amazing and you have an amazing story to tell. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, but let's start with that. Just for our viewers, for those that have never met you before, maybe share a little bit about yourself. And I would love to hear you share about your journey to, to what you're doing today. Thanks so much, Raytine. I'm really honored to be on the show with you today. And yeah, it's been a bit of an interesting journey. I'm a family physician, uh -huh. so I graduated from medical school 25 years ago. I had my own practice for over 20 years. Wow. And during that time, for most of it, I actually believed that abortion was a reasonable decision for women to make. I sent many women for Now, abortions. would you have considered yourself a Christian at the time? No, no, okay. I wasn't. Okay. Um, so, but even after I became a Christian, I still referred women for abortion. I didn't have the full awareness of what was actually going on or the full impact of abortion on women. Right, which we're going to talk more about, but keep going. Yeah, so um, I actually, it was sort of a, a slow process. I started to notice people with Down syndrome in our community, mm. and I thought, mm. They brought a lot of joy to any situation. They really engaged people in a different way. And I began to get a bit offended about why we would say that they didn't have the right to live. Mm. And around that same time, I went to a medical conference and this leading expert in prenatal screening got up and he started saying, screening for Down syndrome is like, for Down syndrome with prenatal testing is like screening for cancer with a pap smear. Mm. And I thought, is this what we have become? Wow. And it really offended me and it made me start to reevaluate my whole view of prenatal screening and really our right to make a decision about who lived and who died. Mm. And so that began a slow process of changing my view um, mm -hmm. about the impact of abortion mm -hmm. and um, the role of abortion in medical practice. Wow. And at that time as well, a, a friend of mine who'd been adopted at birth she approached me and said, you know, when my birth mother placed me for adoption, she really wasn't provided with any support. Hmm. And I really want to make sure that no other woman uh, faces that challenge without the help that she needs. And so together with a small group of people, we started a local pregnancy care center in our town. Which is called Christine's Place. Christine's Place, yes. Right? So her oh. birth mother's name was Christine. Oh. And I saw first. And it's amazing. Like, girls can come in there. They can get free clothing yeah. for their babies, free food, support, counseling. It's Yeah, they get thing. practical support. So if they are choosing to parent, they get mm -hmm. practical supplies for mm -hmm. their, um, uh, for the baby diapers formula. Mm -hmm. Um, any items that they need after the baby is born, they can get parenting education. But really, all of this came out of what you were seeing on the front lines as a physician. Yeah, so in sort of, of to back up on that, what I realized was, even though I cared about this issue, when mm. I presented a woman with her options, when mm. she was challenged by an unplanned pregnancy, mm -hmm. it was pretty empty. I could say, you know, you can have an abortion, these are the clinic numbers, you can um, parent, you can place a child for adoption, but really, that young girl sitting in front of me with uh, terror on her face really had no one to support her in the community. There was no organized safety net for people to leave and actually um, look for help for the other options other than abortion. Which is and, a massive conversation. And I'd like to say, I know this isn't the physician sort of conversation, but from a fiscal conversation, actually, like here we are uh, funneling millions of dollars into making abortion available for women, and yet uh, very little is going towards services, right, uh, mm -hmm. for women who just simply want support in their pregnancy. And so you found that as a physician, there was hardly anything out there. Yeah, there was really nothing. In our town, I knew that there was nothing. Mm. And I just thought, I, I realistically, I, have, I can't help these young women. I have 20 minutes to go over this life-impacting decision, regardless of what she decided. It was a decision for her life. Mm -hmm. And that's and what a lot of women, I, I don't think, understand, is that this will impact the rest of their lives yes. for most women, right? Unless they have some kind of odd capacity to just totally mentally and emotionally change the channel. Um, you know, most women, don't, you know, make kind of think this is just going to be a couple hour procedure, but it ends up impacting yeah. the whole rest of their life. And what I realized was 
I would send people for abortions and then I would never ask them about it. Mm. And I, I just felt like this is a hard decision. Mm. It's a private decision in medical school, even though we learned all about the science of mm. life and fetal development, the treatment for abortion was really about fixing a problem for a woman. Mm. And we really left it to her to determine whether she did that. And you and, never asked the question, did it create I, more problems? Of even course. physicians that believe in abortion and provide abortions, Many of them just don't have the full awareness of the impact on women. And mm. so they still believe, I, I truly believe that they have the impression that they are helping women. Uh -huh. So when you began to ask that question, we've got about a minute left here before okay. we're going to throw to a clip, but you began to ask that question of how is this impacting women? What, what did you begin to discover? When I got involved with the local pregnancy care center and women started telling me their stories, mm. I was... I was really surprised. I was mm. surprised at how much reg regret they had, their sorrow, mm. the grief, and mm. I really regretted not asking them and not having a place where they could actually share this um, great sorrow. Sounds like you're more than just surprised. It sounds like you're a bit wrecked. Yeah, <laughs> you got me going on this one. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to make you cry here. We've no, got all this TV me makeup on. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It, uh, it breaks my heart. It's one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing. Wow. And in a minute, we're going to learn more about what exactly you do in the day to day and why you do it. But before that, we're actually going to watch a clip about a woman who actually did receive mm -hmm. uh, some support and the difference that it made in her life. So let's go to that clip and then we'll be right back to talk some more with Dr. Laura Lewis. I was living with my mom and that's where I grew up. I left my mom's and went to the UK because my fiance lives over there. So I lived over there for a few months with him. So that was my third trip over and we got pregnant with David. Like that was exciting for us because we, well, exciting and nerve wracking because we weren't exactly planning a pregnancy but we weren't exactly not planning a pregnancy at the same time. So we got pregnant with him and when I came back, I started getting on like the doctor care. My mom and I kind of had a rocky relationship, so I couldn't really be under her roof. So I ended up up at chrysalis up at the shelter up here just to have a safe roof over my head because I was 37 weeks by the time I moved in there. I came up here and it's just like well I guess I gotta start over again basically. One former support I had down in Bradford told me about Christine's place and told me to access them for supports. The week that I moved into the shelter, I came in here on the Friday and I met Dottie and Katie was here at that point. She was new to the town, so she didn't know where resources were. She wasn't familiar with the geographical area. She didn't have any family or friends here. She was almost ready to have her baby. So it really tugged at my heart to really want to come alongside her and help her. I felt it was safe because I got welcomed in by Dottie and Katie and all the volunteers here. And it just felt kind of like a little home environment because I was kind of welcomed in as part of a big family. So it was nice to connect with people and people who had kind of walked in similar footsteps. Coming to the Cutie Pie Lunch and the parenting and the abortion support has really helped because I've connected with other women around here and other families and one of them I've gone out swimming with, another one I've gotten together for like lunch with because we're both doing it on our own. She has two, I have one. I moved from the shelter into a shepherding home. They were a lovely family. I was very grateful to be with them as I moved in there when David was three and a half weeks old. And it really helped me kind of gain that confidence that I was missing. Since Sarah 
has joined Christine's place and has been coming. I've seen uh, her progressing as a beautiful young mom. She's full of life and quite curious and has brought her son along with that curiosity. So I see that in David as well. She's uh, got some longer term friendships now over the last several months that she not only visits with these girlfriends here, but she's out and about in our town. He needs me to be there as the best person I can be, and I just, I want that for him. I just I want him to grow knowing that he's well loved, well accepted, and he's my little special baby for sure. <laughs>you know what I love about that clip is it highlights just the power of support mm -hmm. and what I neglected uh, to to say at the beginning of our first interview segment here was who you are and what you do and that it, you are the national director of an organization called CAPS now what does CAPS stand for the Canadian Association of Pregnancy Support Services right so CAPS is a national best practice affiliation and right. we help to support establish new pregnancy centers and locations and equip the ones that are in existence and okay. then we provide training, support, encouragement, resources. So all over Canada, we have these, they're mostly charitable or nonprofit organizations yes. that have been privately started. I don't think really any of them are, are funded by the government or no. started by the government. No. They're all just private individuals like yourself starting Christine's Place saying, hey, we want to bring practical support to these women uh, who need help in their pregnancy experience. Now, study after study has shown that women say that they would have chosen to keep their babies if they simply had more support. So that's really significant. And also, another study when we were um, talking about, uh, actually it was Roxanne's law at Parliament, said that 64% of women uh, who have abortions said that they felt bullied or pressured into it. Right? That's huge. That's a majority, right? 64%. So, uh, so what we have happening in Canada is, is women saying that they, they don't feel supported. Uh, if they did feel supported, they would keep their babies. And in some situations, many situations you have the opposite of support where people are actually being young girls are actually being badgered uh, into their abortion uh, and I won't even say decision because it's like they're being bullied into it and so the work that you do with resourcing crisis pregnancy centers is just phenomenal tell us about it tell us how how we can get involved yeah, so we believe that every woman has the right to make an empowered, well-informed decision. Mm -hmm. And what I know is true from choice. Working, yeah, it's true choice. <laughs> from working on the front lines is that many women actually huh. don't really understand all of the circumstances that are making their pregnancy feel like a crisis because it's not right. the pregnancy that's the crisis. Right. It's all of the overwhelming situational factors. Yeah, exactly. And what many women need is someone who will sit down with them and really tease through all of those layers and right. help them understand. Maybe it is that one of one patient, she said that her boyfriend's mother forced her to have an abortion you that she that didn't want. And yeah. she said, I really didn't know what else to do. I felt like I had no other choice. Yeah. And that isn't good I, enough. I remember a, a young girl, our, our mutual friend, actually, Lisa, uh, who the boyfriend's mother got in her face and said, mm -hmm. you are wrecking my son's life yeah. if you have this baby. Yeah. That's intense. It's intense. That is not pro-choice. That is pro-abortion. That is bullying. Yeah. Right? And th this is what a lot of these girls are facing. Yeah, the, the amount of pressure and even just fear. Fear is another form of pressure. Maybe that's not the same as coercion, but how will I finish high school? Yeah. I'm in college, I yeah. have dreams, I've got aspirations, this doesn't fit in with my plan. Those are all external pressures that mm. many times women and men just need someone to sit down with them and say, you mm. know what, we've, we've seen this before. There are other ways that you can get your high school degree. There are other ways that you can maybe structure your life. And, and so um, that's what you do through these crisis pregnancy yeah. centers. And so the pregnancy centers are very much about empowering yeah. well-informed decisions. Right. And so that's... That just accurately. sounds amazing. That sounds amazing, <laughs> level-headed, Canadian. I love that. Let's do more <laughs> of that in Canada, Laura. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing, that if people really are pro-choice, we fit beautifully mm -hmm. into that spectrum. And mm -hmm. we really are about 
giving women an actual right to make a well-informed decision. Right, because so many of these women don't feel like they have a choice no. because they don't have support. Yeah. yeah. And so pregnancy centers support them if they choose to carry their pregnancy to term mm -hmm. with practical supplies like we discussed, educational Amazing. resources. If they place a child for adoption, we make sure that they're connected with a licensed agency, that they're supported in the grief and loss after mm -hmm. placing their child for adoption because wow. that can be hard. Of course. And if they choose to have an abortion, we want women to know that they are welcome to come back. There's post-abortion support. We believe in making sure that they know that they're cared about as well as their baby. Of course, amazing. Now, if somebody's watching this and they're saying, oh, there's nothing like this in my community, mm. you know, and I want to be a part of starting uh, some support services right in my community. As I mentioned, the, the provincial and federal governments don't seem to be super motivated to be starting these centers. So, so really it's in the hands of individuals. Where would somebody who has that heart cry, where would they start? Just give come you an email? To, yeah, <laughs> right. Come to our website. Okay. Uh, what CAPS, is your website? So it's C-A-P-S-S-com, CAPS.com. Okay. So connect with, with us, and uh, we, have, we have a startup manual. It's a very detailed step-by-step -step essentials manual. We have information resources. We coach people and communities uh, for this initial startup phase because it's tricky, and you have to really do things well, and we believe in doing things with excellence so that our communities trust us, that they know that mm -hmm. you know, even if they have a different worldview, that they believe that what we will provide will be excellent and caring and filled care, with yeah. Yeah, compassion and love and care for the person regardless of who Amazing. they are, where they've come from, what their ultimate decision will be. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Laura, you are amazing. And you know the, the words that I keep hearing are essential services. This is an essential service for our nation. And so, uh, you know, I want to encourage um, everybody out there who's watching this interview to find out more about CAPS. Um, we can donate, right, to, to CAPS, but also to any crisis pregnancy center across Canada. We need to be doing that sort of thing. Uh, we can volunteer. And, you know, we also need to be continuing to contact our elected officials uh, to ask them to release funding to uh, support women who are vulnerable in pregnancy. Would you agree? That is one of the barriers oh. to seeing this happen mm -hmm. in a greater capacity. Well, I know uh, on behalf of our organization, our family, our ministry, we are going to continue to support uh, your work. Thank you so much for being here with us today. This has been so insightful. And thank you for your compassionate approach on this very, very important issue that impacts so many Canadians. Thank you, Faitine. Well, I was 16 when I first became pregnant. I didn't really believe it was real still. You know, you're kind of, ha ha, this is funny, good joke. But then I went into the doctor's office to get my official, yes, you are for sure pregnant. She did my pregnancy test and she said, you're right, you're pregnant. And so that was when the tears kind of came flooding in and the emotions suddenly were just like heightened. I knew I had three options, basically one, to become a parent, two, to have an abortion, and three, to put the baby up for adoption. She said to me, I've had a lot of people sit in that chair you're sitting in now and regret their abortions. She said, but not once have I ever met a single mother who has ever regretted having their baby. Feeling lots of, what am I going to do? So many things whirling through my head and then after a month I kind of thought, felt, okay, well maybe I'm not meant to have this baby, you know, things aren't really working out and so because they just tell you that it's a blob of cells and that it's just, you know, you're not doing anything. It doesn't hurt the baby, but the heartbeat starts at 21 days, brainwaves start 45 days, and before you even find out you're pregnant, the baby is definitely living and definitely functioning as a human. I, I know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and I know that he is in my life right now because he needs to be, and God wanted him to be on this earth. It's pretty amazing that you could just love someone so little so much. I just can't imagine not having him here with me today. And what I would be doing if he wasn't in my life right now. I think I'd be very lost and wondering. <laughs> This November, where was my baby? <laughs> Life is a beautiful gift. And I think that we can never take it for granted or 
put ourselves in a position where we can be the controllers of life. Hey, because honestly, you know, look at how precious that is. You're just too cute for words, hey? <laughs> Choose life. You're never gonna regret it. Hi there, my name is Fatine Grzeski and I wanna share with you about a simple but very powerful initiative. So powerful that it has the ability to actually save lives. It's called No Not This One Canada. What No Not This One is, is a network where we receive tips from crisis pregnancy centers or individuals across the nation when a woman is considering an abortion. These tips come in and then we shoot them out to an amazing committed group of intercessors. We shoot them out by email or by text. And when these intercessors receive these alerts, they then begin to rumble. They begin to pray and say, no, not this one, God. God, would you spare this precious child? Would you move upon the heart of this mother to choose life instead of death? Would you cause a support system to be raised up around her so that she would have options towards life instead of being pressured towards death? And you know what's amazing is we have heard so many stories of women who have gone into abortion clinics uh, planning on committing an abortion, yet they had a change of heart because somebody was praying for them. Somebody was lifting up their name before the throne of grace. And they walked out of that abortion clinic, decided not to abort their baby and have never regretted it. And so we wanna invite you to be a part of this initiative going forward. You can sign up at thejusticewall.com it's justicewall.com. And once you sign up, you will immediately begin receiving these alerts as we receive them by email or text. Please join us in saving lives through prayer. Thank you so much for being with us today to look at this topic that so profoundly impacts so many Canadians. You know, I have faith. I have faith in the amazing hearts and common sense of Canadians. I know that as we continue to talk about this issue with love, compassion, a willingness to look at the science and listen to those who have personally been impacted by abortion, that we will see some amazing dialogue come forward and dialogue that will lead to great and compassionate solutions for our time. So let's continue to talk. We look forward to connecting with you online and we look forward to seeing you again. Till next time, God bless. When you partner with us, not only are you partnering with a television show that is talking to Canadians about important issues from a unique perspective, but you are also partnering with national prayer initiatives, equipping events, assistance and outreaches to the poor, rescuing women from the sex trade, and child sponsorship in several third world nations. Thank you so much for your support. It really makes a difference.